Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So it seems it's not yet time for Jackson, but happily it's time for Brexit. <laughs> 2016 will go down the history of our great nation as the year when there was a real uprising of true patriots. Of the year when the ordinary people of this nation retook control of their own destiny and decided that we as a nation would make our own laws would obey our own courts, would control our own borders, and would make our own trade deals. And it was a treat beyond imagining. On the er in the early hours of the 24th of June, to see that vista of liberation opening up before our eyes. Nineteen sixteen was a year of great sacrifice for our nation. Two thousand and sixteen will go down as the year of liberation. Of our but the challenge now is to ensure it is delivered. Delivered exactly as the people voted for. No blurring of the edges. No retreating. No attempt permitted to give us anything other than Brexit in all its forms. I hear people talk about soft Brexit, hard Brexit. I'll tell you what we want. We want a complete Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> I also hear some talk about special status for Northern Ireland. I think we'd have learned enough in Northern Ireland about special status. <laughs> Let me deal with this nonsense of special status. There can be no, no status that's special that keeps Northern Ireland half in, half out of the EU. We joined as one nation, we leave as one nation. Yes. And Arlene Foster has a bounden duty to ensure that that is precisely what is delivered for Northern Ireland. And if she holds the line on that, she'll have our support. She wilts and compromises on that. She'll have our wrath. <laughs> the test, ladies and gentlemen, is whether or not the leaving of this part of the kingdom is as emphatic and as clear and is irreversible as that of the rest of the nation. There can be no diluting, no diluting of our terms of exit in comparison with those of the rest of the nation. None whatsoever. So what would be the consequence of taking up some of these crazy notions that Northern Ireland, for example, stays in the single market while the rest of the United Kingdom leaves. That we stay in the customs union 
while the rest leaves. The consequence, ladies and gentlemen, would be that the border would be the Irish Sea. That's what the consequence would be. Because with single market membership comes free movement of labour, all the being subject to all the regulations and stipulations and contributions of the EU to the EU. Leaving the single market unshackles us, leaves us free as leaving the customs union does to do, make our own trade deals across the world. It would be an incomprehensible nonsense to a part of the nation, be it Scotland, be it Northern Ireland, or anywhere else, one foot in and one foot out. It cannot, it must not be allowed to happen. It would not work. And of course, some of those who are so upset by us unshackling ourselves from the EU, the source of their real upset is that the consequences of us unshackling ourselves from the Irish Republic. Because it's the Irish Republic's membership of the EU that distinguishes them, will now distinguish them from us. And I would not be surprised, ladies and gentlemen, that one day, if it isn't already beginning to happen, that the penny will drop with the Irish Republic as well. That they'd be far better out. But that's a matter for them. We've made our choice. Now that choice must be delivered. And delivered it will be. So the test for Northern Ireland, and the, the, the touchstone for deciding whether what is offered is right or wrong, is our leaving no less emphatic and no less evident than that of the rest of the kingdom. That's what it must be. And nothing short of that is in the least acceptable. Of course, in 2016, ladies and gentlemen, it was not just in the United Kingdom that the little people had their say. In the United States of America, we also saw an upset. When Donald Trump was elected. Let me tell you the best thing about Donald Trump. It is that he's not Hillary Clinton. <laughs> say I was delighted to see the defeat of the meddling Clintons. But for us, ladies and gentlemen, the real lesson to be drawn from the election in the United States is the very simple observation that you saw democracy allowed to be in action. You saw the people of the United States allowed to change their government. If they were subject to the restraints to which democracy is subject in this part of the world, then you wouldn't have Donald Trump as president. The outcome would have been a joint presidency of Trump and Clinton. <laughs> How absurd would that be? President Dillery. <laughs> and doesn't that underscore the absurdity of the arrangements in Northern Ireland. That this year too, we had an election 
But we weren't allowed to change our government. We weren't allowed to vote a party out of government. You see, in the United States and in any working democracy, whether or not you're in government is in, it lies in the discretion of the people. But in Northern Ireland, whether or not you're in government lies in the discretion of the parties. And if a party chooses, provided it's got enough MLAs, to hang into government, it's guaranteed, as of right, a place in government. But in the United States, and in any democracy worth its name, whether or not you're in government lies in the discretion of the people, not the parties. And until that fundamental is addressed, then we cannot, we will not have true, durable, workable democracy in this part of the world. I'm talking about the absurdity of a joint presidency in the United States brings me, of course, to the Royal Highness's marling. <laughs> What a world, what a dark secret world is the world of Marley, where endless energy is expended on covering up their secret things of darkness. Vividly demonstrated by just a couple of months ago when they took onto themselves royal prerogative powers. You might have thought that, in fact, just six months ago, we elected a legislative assembly in Northern Ireland. In consequence, you might have thought, well, then it must be the legislative assembly that makes the laws in Northern Ireland. Because you might have thought the clue was in the name. How wrong you would have been. Because when it came to the appointment of one David Gordon, yet another spin doctor. They tell us they admit to having 55 spin doctors, but they're now they need a super spin doctor. Well, I suppose in one sense they need all the help they can get. <laughs> But in order to make the provision for the appointment of David Gordon, the law had to be changed to provide for such an appointment. But instead of bringing the proposal to change the law to the assembly, they decided, who needs the assembly? We'll just do it ourselves. We'll exercise Royal prerogative powers. Royal prerogative powers, of course, come from medieval times. They were bizarrely used by many. Henry III once decreed that anyone who killed a fairy was subject to the death penalty. Edward VI once declared that it was an offence to top your boiled egg at the narrow end instead of the broad end. <laughs> and Marlene decided that they would appoint a new super spin doctor. And the Monday morning that David Gordon started his new job, he was called into the inner sanctum to meet Arlene and Marty. And they were very perplexed. And they said to David, David, we have a big first job for you. What is that? 
said the excited David. <laughs> <laughs> we need you to go down to Porta Down. Porta Down? said David. Yes, we need you to go down to Ulster Carpets. I'm here as a, as a spin doctor. I'm not here to measure carpets. <laughs> uh, but you see, David, <coughs> we've got a major problem. There's no more room left under our carpet to sweep away all the dirty business. <laughs> need a bigger, grander carpet, because we have so much to sweep under it. How right they were? Because under that carpet has to go many things. Has to go Nama. And it's pretty bulky. <laughs> Some awkward edges about it. it. Has to be got onto the carpet. Speaking of Marling, I was thinking, of course, it comes from that comedy Only Fools and Horses. Some other characters in Only Fools and Horses. There's Dale Boy. How he would have fitted into the machinations of that. I wonder what his second name, Frank. And then there's Trigger. Now, who could that be? But Nama has to be swept under the carpet. And murder has to be swept onto the carpet, ladies and gentlemen. Let's be very, very clear. This is an executive in the business of sweeping murder under the carpet. Yeah. Kevin McGuigan was murdered by the IRA by no one else, by the IRA. PSNI have said it. The government panel has said it. And yet today, where is the investigation? Where is the inquiry? Where are the consequences of Sinn Féin's IRA buddies murdering Kevin McGuigan. I'll tell you where they are. They're under the carpet. <coughs> and of course, at that time, we had the government panel which told us that not only was there an IRA, but it still had its wicked Army Council controlling both Sinn Féin and the IRA. Where is that finding today? Under the carpet. Because, ladies and gentlemen, everything is trumped by the process. Justice, equity, probity, doing what's right, all comes second to saving the process. <coughs> Little wonder they need such a big carpet. <laughs> There's much more under the executive's carpet. There's one of the biggest, you might think NAMA was bad, and it was. But one of the biggest financial scandals that's going to cost us all over the next 20 years is how the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment dealt with the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme. A scam and a scandal which is going to cost us five to six 
hundred million pounds over the next lot of years. Why? Because there was no proper ministerial control. There were no costs, limitations put in place. There was no cap as there was in GB on the amount of money that you could draw down. And in consequence, we're going to be saddled with that huge debt. And who, ladies and gentlemen, was the debty minister asleep at the wheel? Arlene Foster. You shamefully did not exercise the ministerial control and oversight that ministers are there to exercise. And what did she say about it? Oh, it was off chairman. It was the officials. <coughs> Sorry, the buck stops with the minister. Yeah. But that's something else to be swept under the carpet. What about waiting lists in this country, ladies and gentlemen? When the Sinn Féin DUP amalgam took over the health department in 2011, there were 117,000 people waiting for outpatient appointments. A shocking figure. You know what that figure is today? 243,000 people. More than twice. Nearly a quarter of a million citizens in Northern Ireland waiting for outpatient apartments. And then we have the pretense and the spin that we're getting good government that devolution is about giving us local, accountable, successful government. Tell that to the quarter of a million people on the waiting list. For them, and for so many others in so many different spheres, devolution has done nothing, nothing to enhance their prospects. That's something else to be swept under the carpet. You can see now why they needed such a big carpet. And there's more. Social investment fund. One of the biggest political scandals of many a year. Martin McGuinness. And it's worth noting in itself. This week in the assembly said a very true thing. He said the social investment fund is operating exactly as intended. How true? Because it always was intended to be a slush fund for those they wanted to ingratiate themselves with. Yeah. And that is why 80 million pounds of your money is being distributed to satellite groups of those they wanted to impress and ingratiate themselves to without a single Procurement filter. 80 million pounds handed out to lead partners without even the suggestion of an open competition. I see a few people in this audience who are contractors. You know that if you want to do government work, you have to go through endless hoops on procurement that you have to compete in open competition. But not if you're the front organization of a paramilitary uh, outfit, it seems. Then you're taken by the hand. Special uh, functions are created. 
special way of doing business whereby Marley appoints a steering group upon which sit multiple Sinn Féin and DUP representatives and community representatives. Mm -hmm. And then the steering group sits down and says, who would we like to give the money to? Mm -hmm. And the chap over in the corner, who's not too comfortable wearing a tie, he certainly didn't wear it during the day when he was out collecting the money from the builders. He speaks up and says, ah, you know, we could spend that on my organization. We could do with that. <clears throat> That's all right then. That's just what we'll do. <laughs> you laugh? That's exactly how it happened. The lead partners could only be appointed from those, rep those organizations represented on the steering committee. Someone told me, and I believe it to be true the other day, that in a large housing development in the east of the city of Belfast, to the east, there is the usual pernicious paramilitary attempts at control. And a certain gentleman calls every week for the security payment. And recently he called one day wearing a suit and tie. And they've got so familiar with him, they said to him in the office, you're well dressed up today, Billy. Oh, I, I'm going to a place where there is one committee this afternoon. <laughs> Maybe that night he was going to a meeting of his steering committee as well. Yes, the Social Investment Fund is sadly operated exactly as intended. Because understand its genesis, ladies and gentlemen came into existence after Peter Robinson spectacularly lost East Belfast in 2010. When loyalist voters deserted them in their droves. And the stratagem designed to win them back was to create a slush fund to throw money at organisations that could lead them and impress them. And that is where the Social Investment Fund came from. And of course it suits Sinn Féin equally well. And equally in West Belfast, there is misuse and abuse when it comes to the allocation of fundings. It is about ingratiation with those in the community representing nefarious interests, so that they're kept on board. And that, sadly, is where Marley has brought us in this community. <coughs> but now, in 2016, we've not only seen the bloodless revolution of the people in asserting Brexit. We've not only seen a demonstration from across the Atlantic on how democracy should work and people being allowed to change their government, but now in Stormont we're allowed an opposition. Now they don't want to fund it because even the very existence of them annoys them. But at least we've now got to the point of their being permitted to be an official opposition. Think of it, ladies and gentlemen, that it's a, it is a point of note, a point, a great milestone, 
that in a democracy you should be allowed in opposition. I have to say to you, when I first went to Stormont in 2011, very few people were talking about opposition. But this party persistently raised the issue. We were the standard bearers for the right to create an opposition. And finally, and slowly, but surely, the inevitable happened. And they conceded the right to have an opposition. Well, I want to have, I have a message today for Mike Nesbitt and Colin Eastwood. And I wish them well in opposition, because there's much to oppose. Right? All of them mightn't have the natural DNA of opposition in their veins and in their bodies, but I hope they get there. But I have a message for them. They've taken the right first step, but they need to take the next logical, essential step. Because no matter how well Mike Nesbitt and Colm Eastwood do in opposition, even if they do so fantastically well that come the next assembly election, they respectively become the two biggest parties. And defeat DUP and Sinn Féin. DUP and Sinn Féin are still going to be in their government because of the absurdity of the, the discretion of who's there lying with the parties rather than the people. So Mike Nesbitt and Colm Eastwood need to face and grab hold of the reality that if they're ever to turn the dream, the legitimate, the necessary dream of the people being able to turn an opposition into a government, then they need to abandon their support for the very system that prevents that. Because so long as they prop up odious mandatory coalition, then they guarantee that even if they win, they cannot govern as they should. Because the very people they would have defeated will still, as of right, be in their government. And believe you me, Sinn Féin and the DUP love power any power. They'll be clinging on to their government posts. So Mike Nesbitt and Colm Eastwood need to cross that Rubicon. They need to get to the point of realizing that the logic and the sense of their position in order to give it a chance to succeed requires them to embrace voluntary coalition and abandon their support for mandatory coalition. Unless they do that, and ladies and gentlemen, they're largely wasting their time because they're not creating the circumstances in which an opposition could govern. And is that not the essence and the very raison d'etre of having an opposition? That come an election, the people can decide, yeah, we're with you, we've had enough of them, and we're voting in different parties. So it's pretty elementary, but it's essential next step. And as for TUV, we will continue to do what we do best. I will continue to shine the spotlight of exposure into the dark corners of Stormont. I will continue to be the, the thorn in the flesh of Sinn Féin, DUP, Miss Rule. And I'll rub the salt in as well when I get the chance. And I hope the salt may never lose its soul. As we look forward to the next electoral challenge, it comes in just two and a half years' time in the council elections. And this party will be in the business 
of building our support base from the bottom up and doubling or better our number of councillors. And those we have, I want to pay tribute to them for the lonely, constant battle that they see through in our councils. Well done to you, one and all. <laughs> TUV has been the catalyst for change in this province. We were those who led from the front on opposition. We're still those leading from the front in respect of ending mandatory coalition. And we will go on being that effective catalyst for change. And if 2016 tells us anything, ladies and gentlemen, it tells us that change happens. Never forget it, that in this year of all years, all those who wrote off Brexit, who said it was the lunatic fringe, those of failing and falling support, they could never succeed. Those who said Donald Trump could never succeed. Hillary Clinton was a sure thing. She was the only one who knew anything about government. The people would never be so foolish as to embrace anyone else. Well, they the smile well and truly wiped off their faces, both in London and in Washington. <laughs> so do not lose faith, do not lose hope. Change happens. And it happens, ladies and gentlemen, by persisting by persistently clinging to doing what's right. Yeah. Not what's easy. <laughs> Not what's easy. Any dead fish can go with the tide. But in doing what's right, TV's in business to do what's right. Right Okay, folks.